I think um, we'll get going just because I know I'm the last person between this and drink, so far be it from me to, uh, to um, get in the way of that. I'm Stuart Farr from EPAM. This is supposed to be a talk by, from Ilya Guralik, my colleague. Ilya uh, had to get pulled away at the last minute. Ilya is Russian, I am not. Um, the only difference other than that between us is that he can speak Russian and I can't, uh, at least not before six o'clock. So I'm going to be, other, other than that, we're sort of interchangeable. I don't think he'd mind me saying that. But what I will say is at the beginning, this is hopefully informal, it's the last of the session. So please, if anybody has any questions or comments during, just, just put your hand up and, and, um, and just butt in, frankly. So please, don't want this to be uh, a one way. The title there, I'm not gonna read it out because it's very long, um, but essentially we're looking at um, a time series database and how we, or well, not might use that, do do that uh, for, use it for analytical applications. And I'll show you some of those rather than, rather than just talk about it. So first of all, TimeBase is a, uh, a time series database most simply, but it's more than that to the extent that it's a, it's a streaming system, it's a messaging middleware, call it what you will. So it's time series, dare I say, traditional time series on one hand and a streaming capability on the other. Those two often don't go hand in hand and hopefully I'll show you why we, it does very much do that and why it does that more importantly. It's been out there for 15 years. Um, that's because when I say we, I was with a company called Deltix. We were acquired by EPAM two years ago um, and in, with our Deltix hat on, we, we um, still do, but under Deltix, we worked with systematic and quantitative trading firms and the time series capability is sort of part and parcel of that. Um, and we built our own really uh, to have full control over the stack. So it's been out there 15 years um, and I'll talk about the, the use cases more specifically later, but it's designed to be very fast, um, which befits an algorithmic uh, solution and with very large data sets, sub microsecond as, as you might expect in that environment. Um, it mentions rich data schemas and polymorphism. Again, I'll show you that, just sort of have that as a placeholder. Very importantly though, the APIs, Python, Java, uh, C++ and, and .NET are very important. And some of the applications I'll show you will be um, in, in, I think all of those, certainly Java and, and Python, we've got examples, uh, which I'll show you very shortly. So the reason we're here is that we contributed this uh, time base to the uh, open source community via Finos earlier this year. Um, as a community edition, the first question will be, what's the difference? And I'll show you that difference. Essentially very little. The this is not a teaser application. This is not a teaser product to get people to upgrade to enterprise. It really isn't. Um, I'll, I can go into that in more detail. We actually have online what the differences are, but essentially they're, they're to do with connectivity to exchanges. The kernel and the APIs are, are exactly the same, but we can drill into that if anybody's either concerned or interested about it being a, a, a teaser um, edition, which is not. So some of the use cases, again, I mentioned our background is essentially in algorithmic uh, trading, signal generation, uh, systematic trading. So model generation and back testing of models or algorithms against historical data is sort of use case number one for, for, for that world. Um, and going alongside with that is, is all of those other things. I'm not gonna read through them, but, but essentially this idea of, of using historical data to back test. And then when you're ready, which is a decision point that has a lot of uh, things going into it, we then deploy that for live trading. And that idea of using historical data for, in this case, back testing that example, and then for live trading, that, that sort of switch from his, history to real time is one of the reasons that we call this, because it is a, a time series database and messaging middleware. That, that transition from historical to real time, which is not necessarily a natural transition, for us is a natural transition because it had to be for our, for our business domain that we we're using on. I'm not gonna go through that. Any questions so far? Okay. So the history, there's the history. The most two important ones on there are the uh, cloud support, not surprisingly, a lot of demand for cloud uh, deployments over the last few years. So two years ago, we really made that an emphasis. So a lot of our new clients deployments now are on AWS using Kubernetes to, 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 to deploy and, and scale. And then this year, as I mentioned earlier, it's now within Finos. I'll show you where the repo is uh, very shortly. And I just want to touch on this because um, the Finos people asked me to talk about why we decided to open source this, given that it was and still is 
a commercially licensed product. And the reason for that is it's a fairly, um, well, with a simple knots and other matter. So when we were with Deltic, so pre epan we were a 90 person engineering firm, traditional software house, building uh, software, taking it to market, supporting it. And we were selling commercial licenses, usually annual subscription. So obviously uh, people do make money with an open source uh, business, lots of very good examples. We weren't smart enough to figure out how to do that, even though lots of our engineers were and are, or are and were very supportive of the idea of open source. We just couldn't figure out how to make it work commercially. We got um, acquired by EPAM two years ago. EPAM, for those of you that don't know, is a, is a, a very large engineering firm with uh, doing digital transfer, transformation, engineering services, consultancy uh, with 40,000 engineers. It's New York Stock Exchange listed. Many people haven't heard of it, but it's been going for 20 years and is large. Um, and it's, it's, you can look it up, it's very successful, but it's very much supportive. It is very supportive of open source and it fits the business model. So when we became part of the EPAM family, it was a natural release, if you will, for the philosophy to get out into the open source community and not have to worry about paying for it because somebody else did. Um, so that's how we got there. And and the start of our journey, as I mentioned, really it's this year. Um, they're the resources. I'll show you those um, when we get on to the real time stuff, the live. But timebase.info is, is obviously a, a website resource. There's a lot of information there, um, probably too much, people tell me. But um, the architecture, the documentation, APIs, the differences between enterprise and, and, and uh, this community edition, which I said is not very much, but that's on there, and how it stacks up to other um, of the time series databases that most people are familiar with, KDB being. You know, great example, a very, very good uh, solution at one tick, and then some of the other um, open source uh, um, are compared on timebase.info. And there's the repo there, you can download it obviously and have a good time. Now, um, so I mentioned at the beginning this is more about time series and how do we use this in um, analytics and deployment, examples of deployments for analytical applications. So before we, or as part of that, I'm going to talk a little bit about time series data. Now, in financial services, we tend to always think about, or first and foremost, is, is market data, whether that's level one, two, or three. Market data tends to get the, the lion's share of attention in respect to time series data because it's very pervasive, it's very important, and it drives a lot of things, which we'll come on to. Orders and executions or trades is clearly another very uh, common use case, but then some of the other ones, probably increasingly less common, um, but, but there they are. The, the satellite data and the consumption data and the new social media sentiment, there was a, probably about five years ago, there was a lot of research done on that from a, for signal generation. There was a big um, push on that. We got involved in it quite a bit. We did quite a bit of research using our tools and time base in particular to do that. So time series, the point of this is time series is not just market data. That is foundational and very important, but we shouldn't preclude ourselves. And, and one of the things I'll get to show you a little bit with time base is that you define the data structures. We don't just say, here's, here's a set of data structures, go work with them. You define your own. And there are ones, some there, that are regular ones you would see, but also others that may be less obvious. So shipping data, who's, you know, there's no standard data, data structure for that. So they're the types of data. The, where we use them in financial services, um, you can keep going down with this list. But the point of this list here is really to highlight that we use them, whether we know it or not, um, historical time series and real time. And, and some examples there of, of um, the different uses using different of those real time and historical. Now, the reason we're putting up, there's a lot of common words there. So risk management, whether it's historical simulation uh, value at risk or whether it's real time trading risk, position risk, it's risk. Um, trade surveillance, whether it was after the bad guys did, did some bad things or whether we try and catch them real time, it's surveillance. Um, and algos, obviously, whether we're back testing them or live deploying them, we need historical data and, um, and real time. So the, the point here is that this, there is no hard distinction between historical and real time. Real time now is now historical by its few microseconds since I said that. So this interface, um, we don't see one, essentially. Uh, the difference between real time and historical data for us in our world is the timestamp. And if that's now, it's real time. And if it's not, it's historical. It's, 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 and so we have this concept of the essentially a moving window where we maintain uh, this, this moving window, whether it's measured in microseconds, milliseconds, days, months, or years. It doesn't matter, uh, literally doesn't matter. But, but as new data comes in, it, it moves along. 
Um, and again, you define the width of that. And that's very important when we get to the analytics. So a lot of the common analytics that we use, whether it's simple moving averages or correlations or co-integrations, or even the volume weighted average price, the most simple, is by definition a set of data bounded by time. So the concept of the moving window, whether it's real time and historic, we don't care, we shouldn't care. Uh, and when we get to, again, show some things on the screen, and, and if you do dig down on the documentation, the APIs, the critical point here is the APIs that are used to build applications are the same whether you're listening to real time streaming data or whether you're streaming historical. You don't have to worry about where am I? now versus the history. It's really important. And, and when we, again, because of our background, when we're back testing models and we need to deploy them la now, we don't want to then rewrite them because we spent all this wonderful time and energy building a model and we tested it in MATLAB or some historical data set and then we hit the real world and we have to do a real time and we do, gee, we've got to rewrite it all. So it's very important that this, this interface, there is no effectively change in the, the APIs between historical and real time. So that's how we describe that. Uh, the other thing in analytics nowadays we expect, or our users do, uh, people generally expect it to be, Python is very commonly asked for now, it's an expectation. Uh, tools like Jupyter Notebook, Kafka, there's open source in particular is expected to be used um, as, a, as opposed to, you know, back in the day where you had sort of fixed forms where you had to fill in fixed parameters and then you ran your analytic. Nowadays, the, the people expect uh, the, to, de, to do it themselves essentially with tools that are, that are very accessible. And of course, everything is expected to be deployed on, on, on the cloud. So the point of mentioning these things is that we can't predict whether, or we shouldn't be able to, and if we do, we're restricting ourselves, if we predict whether our users are just going to use historical data or whether they're just going to use time series data. We don't know that. And we don't know whether they're going to need tick data measured in milliseconds or microseconds or whether it's measured in days, weeks or months. So we can't, we can't design for any one of those things. We have to design for all of them, which again makes an a engineering challenge, which, um, oops, wrong way. So this is, this is, I promise you, the last slide before we get on to some, to actually playing with some stuff. One of the when we build applications, analytical applications, those considerations earlier that I mentioned sort of boil down to, again, this isn't exhaustive, but these are some of the things that we have to consider. And the first one there, um, in the days of the, you know, the tradition, I think we can use that word, traditional relational database or Oracle or Sybase, where you had these you know, wonderful store procedures working away on, on the server, were, you know, given whatever time scale you were looking at, were, were typically very fast. You did your processing on the server, you had the power of the service, server to do that crunching, and that was very good from a performance perspective, that is very good, but it's clearly restrictive because you're doing the, cal you're, somebody else is doing the calculations, and then you're giving the results to the person, your consumer, who has to use it, like it or not. So it doesn't make it right or wrong, it just means that that's a restriction. You, you trade off speed for flexibility or lack of flexibility. The other extreme is the opposite of that, is where I'm not doing anything to the data, I'm just going to give it to you, and you're going to have to deal with it, right? You delegate, we're not doing anything. And that's you know, the more the streaming paradigm. And then obviously there's always the compromise, the hybrid between the two, where we do some processing on the server, and then we deliver a filtered data set to our consumer to basically restrict the amount of work they have to do from filtering out stuff they don't need. So there's not rights or wrong in any of those. There are definitely rights or wrongs for given applications, but considerations nonetheless. And then data compression, which tends to get, sometimes gets forgotten. Again, if you're streaming over the internet, clearly, you, well not clearly, but hopefully you have some sort of um, compression algorithm before you deliver it over the, over the internet. Um, and then are you, uh, compressing it on the disk as well. That comes back to how quickly do you need it. So, so those are important considerations there and because there is an overhead obviously of, of compression whether you're doing it on disk or um, streaming it. And then the content, the CDN, content delivery network is a sort of question mark because that's the maybe you know where where the world is going in, in certain certainly market data there are now CDNs that are you know purporting themselves to be the way to receive market data anyway going forward. So just some considerations and then what I'll do now is I'm going to switch over I've got some demos as you can see and see if I can get them running. This is always a
Yeah, okay, so I've got a few here. This is, this is a, as you can see, this is the time base on the left. So this is a, a GUI, a front end, just looking at, at um, in this case, this is streaming, this is real time, this is now. Um, this is market data from, from Gemini. So just on the left-hand side here, these, these are called streams. So that's, I guess, a fairly accepted word in time series land. Tables might be another somewhat cruder way to do it. Um, and the one I've highlighted here is uh, a data structure called Gemini. And Gemini, as you may or may not know, is, a, is a, one of the new crypto exchanges. And what we're doing is, is subscribing to prices from Bitcoin for crypto, for say B, B, uh, BTC and ETH and, and Litecoin. So what we're seeing here is, just, is a real-time update as, as these coins come in. So nothing, this has been done, um, there's nothing new here, but I just want to scroll along and give you some idea. I mentioned earlier about the data structure. So this is a data structure here. There's lots of columns on it. The meat is at the, at the end here. So just as a note, this is an incremental update. So we are supporting in this particular data model both the idea of receiving a snapshot. So most exchanges will send snapshots periodically or only send snapshots and then incremental updates to the order book between snapshots. So this, this what we're looking at here are the ones on the screen. It may change or incremental updates. And if we double click, we can see that data structure a little bit more there. And if we look at the JSON view, there we have it in, in JSON view and, and fairly fairly detailed, lots of timestamps, lots of detail there. So there looks like we're deleting the price, the previous price from level 19 of, of 65,000. Price has gone down today by the look. And then we're inserting another, uh, we're putting a new level in level six at, at that price. So that's that's just streaming data. But I mentioned, I've been mentioning many times is, well, that's great, but what about history? So I'm changing now to look at just BTC USD and there it is flicking away. If I click view, there's my history. So the API that pulls this data out, this is just a very simple screen, obviously. It doesn't care whether it was real-time streaming or it's history. It's the same, exact same data structure. This one's static because it's historical. It's, it's a few microseconds ago or milliseconds ago. This is actually a few days ago, but it's the same view. It's the same query. It's the same, everything's the same except the timestamp. So the other things uh, I can do here, I can graph it. Okay, I'm not going to go. I'm going to go through this stuff pretty quickly because there's, there's nothing particularly new here. I'm just trying to show you the sort of things you can do with the APIs. So let's make this a little bit bigger. We'll look at the last last 15 minutes of um, of uh, BTC USD from from Gemini. So. What we're doing here, and there's a reason I want to show you this, we're doing, I mentioned earlier about, um, so there we are, this is a little graph of, um, we can drill into that, the order book, each of these lines is a level in the order book, um, bids and offers, and the crosses of the trades. Um, the reason I wanted to show you that is because I mentioned this, one of these idea of, do you do the processing on the consumer? or do you do it on the server and send the results? So here we're actually doing a little bit of both. And here's a very simple query. Um, there it's very SQL-like as you can see. Um, and it's we're doing that here um, as well as doing some local manipulation. And one of the things I want to show here, if you, I don't know whether you can see that or not, but CMA, SMA, CMA and EMA, simple compound exponential moving average is very simple, mathematically very simple but are predicated on having this moving window of time because as soon as you get a new tick in, you've got to recalculate everything. So those, those functions are recalculating every tick, maintaining a, a moving uh, a size of a window that has been predetermined. Um, this one's one, one hour by the look of it um, on here. So that's why I wanted to show you that. Again, just in terms of data structure, I mentioned earlier about you can create your own. The uh, schema here is looks like that. It's, I mentioned polymorphism earlier. You can create some pretty rich and complex data structures here. And let's say you, the user of Timebase, the CE, you can download it. You create your own data structures. These are ones we did earlier, as they say. Okay, so that's this is our front end, the one that we built, um, more in the spirit of, of open source. Here is, if anybody's familiar with um, Grafana, this is we just sort of, sort of literally knocked this up. This is basically the same data. This is 
um, crypto, this is BTC uh, USD coming out of the same venue, but using Grafana to, to, to visualize it. Uh, and again, we've got these, this idea of the query here. You can, you can define your own query down here. So very, very sort of hopefully uh, straightforward. I'm going to keep any questions. Yes. Hi, I think we have this very like helpful for like real time data that's changing very frequently. Would you also recommend it for data that's changing infrequently like in the financial services people that reference data, right? For, yes. So. Market, yes, we always show things that move quickly because it looks better, right, than, than, than monthly. The, the, this can be used for data. A lot of our people we work with will do monthly rebalancing, for example. So then the time series is, is month by month and by definition doesn't move very much. For reference data or static data that changes maybe less or maybe more, but less frequency than this moving stuff, this will work. It's, not a, it's probably not the best use case. You're probably better with a more uh, SQL-like um, where if you're, the downside of time series in general, and this, and this included in that, is the concept of joining and doing complex logical joins. This is not well suited for. You can do it, you've got to write code for it, but it's not, not, not optimized for that. So it depends on the use case, but it's not a, I wouldn't say it's a natural, it's a natural fit. Massive repetition, yeah. It'll make a data model as I mean, the traditional data model just hates this stuff because there is so much repetition that it's uh, that it's um, yeah. Yes, please, of course. Uh, just further to to uh, her question, can you query data from an external source to evaluate the processing process there? Yes. So from like a payment engager or something else. Yes. Complementary. You can, and that's often done actually with reference data. So often, let's let's see that ties in quite well. So. When we have uh, people who have, a, which is most people who have an existing reference data store, they don't want to copy it over, but they want to access it. So we'll actually combine the time series with the underlying reference data that has been, that is managed and looked after and cleansed. So very much so. I wanted to watch, uh, show this one as well, because guess what? It's, it's, uh, it's BTC USD again, but more importantly, this is um, perspective. So for those of you who are familiar with, and if you're not, hopefully you will be now, with the perspective um, open source contribution from JP Morgan, this is it. So this is the, again the same, well, this is ETH USD as opposed to BTC, but it's the same data source other than the symbol being different. And we just, literally, I'm not gonna say knocked up because that would imply sloppiness, but um, from a speed perspective, we put this together pretty quickly for this demonstration to use the, the perspective tool that's available in the Finos repo to visualize essentially the same data set. Um, and it's actually pretty cool. We, we actually quite like this. So this is a traditional order book view. I'm not going to go through this. You've got bids and asks and different levels ticking away. But they've got these really cool, um, you can representations historical, which is sort of neat. You don't see that very often. In fact, I've never seen that. And uh, they've got a vertical chart as well. So this is, this is really, we're actually like this a lot because this is bringing the power of, of somebody else's expertise on this particular visualization tool and integrating it with our APIs on top of time base. So this is a very real and hopefully useful example of, of, of building an analytical application that is, that is putting, in this case, two open source tools together. Um, in no, I did say I would um, show you conscious of time. I mentioned timebase.info earlier. So this is, this, is, this is that. A few things I wanted to point out on here, the architecture, um, obviously you can go through this. There's a lot of detail in here that, that talks about the design and the, and the architecture of timebase. And essentially it's, okay, I'm not gonna go through this, but I would, if, if you are interested, this is, a, people tell us we put too much stuff up here given it's still a commercial license, but, but, but it's up here and, and we think it's pr pretty good. And the differences between uh, time series, common time series, commercial and open source is there. The differences between different message brokers, because it's this messaging idea as well, are up there as well. And documentation, the APIs, um, essentially we're a development organization, so there's a lot of API um, documentation up here as well. Yes, please. Um, I saw the references in the... To what, I'm, to what I'm sorry? Yes. 
Um, we can not. Yes, we have done. Is it part of the product? No, it's not. But yes, we do do. We can do that. We have done that, I should say. But not, it's not part of that, this time base. Yes. Scale, yes. It's really fast. Is that good enough? The, um, it's really fast and does terabytes. It's, it's, we've got metrics on here, but, but let me, most of the clients that we have, we are working with terabytes, small terabytes, not 100 terabytes. So terabytes is a sort of normal size, if that means anything. Um, from a speed perspective, we, we, we used to have this measure, which is still true, it's probably faster now, but it was from a streaming perspective, a million messages, I'll come back to what I mean by that in a second, messages per second per call was our basic benchmark. Um, and a message, going back to the granularity, if that's a level two, it's every time the, you know, the order book moves. If you're just you know, doing top of book, it's that. If it's daily data, then it's that. So each of those is a message and a million per call is essentially the benchmark um, message. We, we got up to a billion, I mean, it's not all about speed, but it is. Um, we got up to a million, a billion messages per second when we spread out on a, a nice number of cores on, on AWS. But it's measured in millions per second. Latency is a, a microsecond measured, and, and size is typically terabyte size. So we're not going to say it's the fastest. It's very fast. There's, you know, there's always a speed race. But uh, that gives you. Does that give you some sense? I'm trying not to wave my hands too much, but uh, <laughs> it's uh, give you some. Yes, please. I'm just curious. About That's that's a beer conversation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, not offline. You take that one to the bar. That's that's a that's a bar conversation. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah, so the other thing I should have finished with what I was answering that question earlier about. So it scales down and scales up. So this is not running on there, but we used to do all our demos on two core laptops running fast queries. Typically, uh, so you said US equities level two. That may be like a 16 core machine on a single M2 X5, is that what that is? Something like that. We normally just use one compute node on AWS. For most use cases, yes, 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 absolutely. And then, and, and that's why oh, I don't need to tell anybody about why AWS is useful. But but if it isn't 16 cores and it happens to be more, then that's not a big deal. So, it, but it is designed. It, and the reason it's designed, this is a little bit of history, but um, a lot of our engineers are in are in are in Minsk. And back in the day, 15 years ago, they didn't have all these great machines. They had very old machines, and they didn't have they had to design very good software to perform on the machines that they had. So that's, that's what they did. Um, I think, um, well, not I think, I know I'm getting waved at. So any, any more questions? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, any more questions before we wrap up? I, I, I was I'm pretty much done. I was just showing you some, some examples. But uh, any more questions otherwise? Very good. Thank you very much. <laughs>